Um, what I'm going to do this evening is look at a piece of research, which is quite small in a way, and I don't want to oversell it, but it did um, attract a lot of surprising attention um, earlier in the year. And it, it's quite small in itself, and it does something which I think you, you know, anybody in the arts would regard as rather obvious, but it's very much addressed to the neuroscience community. And it was, it, it's been triggered at least in part with a dissatisfaction with how art and neuroscience have interfaced, not in the work of someone like Andrew, but um, more generally in the question, the big questions about why we find something beautiful, etc., etc., um, which seems to me to not to be the, the most interesting or tractable question. Um, looking at works of art as an art historian, we're concerned with a lot of mess, a lot of noise, which of course the scientists don't like. In labs, they, you know, that's, not, that's not what you need. Um, the, for the art historian, the noise, the complexity, the contextual nature of viewing, the extraordinary complexity and variability of acts of viewing in different circumstances, that noise is part of what we live with and it's part of what makes the job creative. Uh, but it's very difficult to handle in terms of neuroscience and laboratories because the, the habits are not geared up for that. It's not a criticism of the science because um, uh, science has its ways of proceeding. Um, there's obviously a lot of noise involved in looking at works of art, um, very literally. Uh, looking at works of art is hugely coloured by expectation, knowledge, uh, context, who you're with and so on. And this is um, just a, a, an, em an emblem of that. Um, an art historian would be interested in uh, why acts of looking and why Franz Hals on the left and Rembrandt on the right, the wonderful portrait of Jan Steeks, why, um, why these are somewhat different experiences, though closely related experiences. And for neuroscience to handle this is um, beyond what, uh, what really can be done. Other, as I hope to suggest, in terms of certain nuances of reception and um, some of the things which are now entering neuroscience. Uh, and in terms of content, you know, what happens when we've got two images which, again, by, uh, both by Rembrandt, which are not unrelated in terms of how they're set up, what, what is portrayed. One is, as we can recognise as a portrait, the other one is an image of Christ. Mm -hmm. It needn't be, but uh, there are a whole series of signs there that it is an image of Christ. What happens when we're dealing with things which formally and paint in painterly terms are rather similar but have different contexts? And uh, for the most part, neuroscience hasn't really been dealing with content um, of whatever, whatever kind. Um, the project I worked with uh, was uh, about authenticity, but it was a particular uh, take on it, and it came about because an American student I've been corresponding with for some years, uh, for two years, called Mingfei Huang, uh, got a Fulbright, and she wanted to work on neuroscience and art, and I was already in discussion and done bit, various bits of work with Andrew Parker, the professor of physiology, who is one of the uh, more responsive people in the art and neuroscience area, a very distinguished scientist in his own right. And I said to them, one of the things which I think is tractable in a serious way in, uh, in neuroscience and art is reception. The reaction of the viewer, nuancing out the reaction of the viewer, particularly given the, 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 psycho, uh, the, phys the psychophysiological factors, the links which are now being understood between different parts of the brain, not just going into the visual cortex or whatever. And it was based upon something which I used to do with the students. And this is a Leonardo drawing at Windsor of Judas for the Last Supper. Some of you may have seen it in the National Gallery show. Terrific Leonardo drawing. And I proved to the students it was a fake. Um, you, you can point to the ear. Oh, that's not very good, is it? Not a well down here. What about that? It's a nostril. It doesn't sit properly. The chin is not, that, that is not entirely convincing, etc., etc. 
And once I said it's not by Leonardo, it's actually a fake, they saw lots of other things wrong with the drawing as well, which were not necessarily wrong with it. So I was very interested in that. I stopped doing this actually with my students after a bit because I was destroying perfectly good drawings. And in fact, I couldn't look at them without this lurking <laughs> sense. Uh, so I was taking perfectly good orthodox drawings. The reason this is quite casual is that Leonardo was working on the neck. And the rest, he can be quite casual when, he's, when that's not the major focus of it. So um, I, I, this is, I think it's perfectly OK. And it's, it sat, it sat beside the other Leonardo Last Supper drawings perfectly well. So and I think we've all had that experience when we're told that something is a fake or it's not what we thought it was or it's by somebody else. There's a cascade effect. We suddenly start noticing all these things. And I, I get shown Leonardo forgeries. And once you've got one little bit which has collapsed in terms of whether it's Leonardo, the collapse occurs in a very big field. So what we decided to do was to take on Rembrandt um, uh, the Polish rider, which is just indicates how tricky these Rembrandt problems are, that was bought on the advice of Roger Fry when he was at the Met by the Frick collection and for a time was one of the best regarded, most highly regarded of Rembrandt paintings. The Polish rider, it became one of the great images. Um, it was then disattributed, or mis uh, unattributed, or what's the correct verb for this is, and attributed to a man called Van Drost, um, and it was generally accepted that it wasn't by Rembrandt. The Rembrandt Research Project has now reinstated it, and in the relevant volume in the Rembrandt Research Project, which has been kind of certifying all the Rembrandts and things of autograph, it's called by Rembrandt and a later artist, so this, um, which is a kind of compromise which involves. Um, more subtle discriminations than I can exercise on Rembrandt. But it indicates the problems, and the advantage of tackling Rembrandt is we've got masses of uh, Rembrandt and Rembrandt-like things. And the Rembrandt Research Project has assembled all these, and there's probably no artist where there are so many works by followers, not overt fakes, but just somebody else producing producing Rembrandts. Svetlana Alpen's Rembrandt's Enterprise is rather good on this, but the book, which is really terrific on it, is Joe Heller, who Catch-22 Men, wrote a book called Picture This. Has anybody read that? Yeah, Gary, it's good, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah, but a bit overly clever. Oh, so, okay. so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, if you're interested, Joe <coughs> Heller, Picture This. It's a very good on... Um, uh, yeah, very... Uh, Joe Hello is, in a sense, almost stigmatised, doesn't he, by Catch-22, and, you know, he's a one-person one book, you're an author, but this is absolutely not the case. Still, that's an aside. Um, so we had all, we, could, we would have all these things, some of which are Rembrandts and some of which are not Rembrandts. Let's have a vote. Uh, no, the images are so terrible, I won't do that. Um, <laughs> they look okay on the computer. But uh, the, the central one is Rembrandt, the one on the left is, is not, and the one on the right is early Rembrandt, so, that, so it doesn't look, look quite right. Uh, and uh, uh, what we decided to do was to get a group of experimental subjects and to label these things, which um, are pretty closely related as Rembrandt or non-Rembrandt in, in a random way, completely scrambled them using protocols for, for scrambling them. We told the experimental subjects, there were 15 of them, um, we gave them a little blurb on Rembrandt and said, well, um, Rembrandt was greatly admired, greatly imitated, therefore there are lots of non-Rembrandts as well as autograph Rem Rembrandts around. And we labelled them, um, it was difficult categorising them, so they, they wanted to call them fakes, the, the scientists. So I tried, got, tried to keep them off fakes and I, I said authentic and copy would do, it was fake is a bit overly loaded, and these are not fakes. Many of them are works in the style of Rembrandt by followers and uh, not, a, not fakes in our, in our modern sense. Fourteen participants, we had 25 um, labelled as authentic, um, 25 labelled as copy and three labelled as neither. Um, the experimental subjects were told over their uh, over earphones whether they were authentic or copy, so as not to get in the way of the uh, the visual, the visual experience. In the actual 
the areas that are involved in the acts of seeing, um, the occipital temporal, temporal areas, um, there was no discernible difference. Made no difference at all whether we said that it was copy or, 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 or authentic. But in other areas of the brain, um, when we, they were told it was a copy, all sorts of things started happening. Very complicated. Um, the, um, this is the article which we produced in uh, Frontiers and Human Neuroscience, if anybody wants, wants the references. And those are two of the actual works which we chose. You can see very close. Um, one ex accepted by the Rembrandt Research Project as Rembrandt and the other not. But it didn't matter to us in a way whether it was authentic. We weren't testing people's connoisseurship. We were testing their reaction to what they were being told about the work and seeing, uh, and seeing what happened. And what we found was that there were very strong uh, psychophysiological interactions between other parts of the brain. Um, other parts of the brain came into play much more strongly when they were told it was a copy. The frontopolar cortex, which is associated with complex way with memory, uh, multiple goals and hypotheses, was activated and was clearly interacting with the, with the visual areas. And the precuneus, which is associated with the higher cognitive functions, consciousness and memory, the common thing in those cases is memory, was also activated. Um, so what we found, and that's a little summary of the overall conclusion, and this shows you um, some of the illustrations from the paper, there was a significant statistical outcome. It's consistent with the top-down signal from the frontopolar cortex to occipital regions, that's the, the regions of the, region of the visual, doing the visual job, or a redirection of outputs from the occipital regions away from each other, um, other cortical regions towards the frontopolar cortex with no net change in the activation of the occipital regions. Um, in short, uh, what we were finding was that areas of the brain connected with analysis and above all memory were being activated when they were told this was a that we were dealing with a copy. What happened to this relatively modest little paper, which basically told me as an art historian the obvious, i.e. we start seeing things very differently when we think it's not authentic, uh, took off. It got on the, the um, I was on the study program with it. The, pre the university press office issued a thing about it saying it was about fakes. Um, because that was the story, as it were, once you talk about fakes, it's different from copies. And people get very interested in it. So it got on the Today programme, it got on this and that, and got extraordinary coverage. And it's a little, small, short article, and the student is a master's student. So it's interesting how it took off. Uh, and the Today programme, basically, the introduction was, oh, well, we only see what we're told to see, and that we can tell anybody to, and they'll believe absolutely anything. That wasn't the message. And um, I think there is a central, robust core, which um, visual core, which uh, which still remains. But the point of it was to say we are we've got one bit of contextual evidence, one bit of contamination, as it were, of the act of looking, complication, skewing of the act of looking. However, you want to uh, do it, which tells you how complicated contextual and untidy acts of looking are in, in relation to works of art. It's not about just about the visual cortex, it's not about perception, it's not about the generalities of how, how the brain works, but it's linking through to these other areas and how the statement can trigger a set of interactions with other parts of the brain. Uh, my reservation about this is still, it's quite simple that you're setting the threshold of, of the detection of the equipment high enough to get meaningful results. But I think it's quite possible that areas of the brain which are not active to d discernible levels, given the threshold of, of the setting, are actually playing a, still playing a significant role. I've likened it to a rudder on a liner, an ocean liner. A tiny thing can have a huge directing effect to the whole ship. Um, where do we go from here? Well, um, what I would like to do, though I'm not part of academic research programs anymore, 
is more into reception, looking at expert viewers. And I don't just mean art critics. Um, at, say, um, somebody who is an Eastern Orthodox believer and how they see an icon compared with, say, I as an art historian see an icon or, or how somebody else who's non-expert sees an icon. And I'm also uh, interested in getting the equipment out of the lab. Um, for Material World, um, they have a series of young scientists propose projects. Yesterday I was in Modern Art Oxford and we were actually using um, skin resistor detectors um, to monitor the, um, the reactions of people in an art gallery. It's still not an entirely sort of neutral, it's not the normal busy art gallery we did it to, with an empty art gallery of modern art Oxford. And then we're doing the same test back in the lab to see what happens. Your labs, if you're sitting in an MRI scanner, um, it's not exactly a normal environment. Um, it's noisy, uncomfortable, and very loaded in a particular way. And labs are very loaded. You know, you take art in a lab and it's, uh, it's as loaded an environment as it could be, but it's not the normal loadings that go on. So I'm very interested in in getting this and the, the person who made this absolutely state-of-the-art skin resistor it used to be called galvanic skin response it's now got some other more fancy name which i can't tell you um, but the man who makes all this kit i'm now talking to him about um, doing something which can actually uh, measure responses reactions and reception in a in a more freewheeling gallery context where we're bumping into people talking to friends etc etc Anyway, it's just a little piece of research, but it's, it's saying not least it's saying to neuroscience there are actually really tractable, interesting problems which art historians have, which you're, you might be able to solve rather than just telling us what we find beautiful. Okay, thanks very much.